So it's time to talk about love. You'll find on page 146 a self-test on the kind of lover you might be. Uh, it gives you a scale to work from and at the bottom talks about um, talks about how to place yourself on the scale. And it mentions uh, Lee, uh, Mr. Lee. Um, you'll find his book in the back under our uh, in the in the bibliography. Um, what was his first name? Did it? Did it? A. M. Lee. No. Uh, blah, 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 blah. J. A. Lee. Uh, in uh, his book, The Colors of Love. The Colors of Love. Um, Lee took some other work that had been done on, uh, on love and, and its nature and codified it and, and expanded it and discussed it in this book, The Colors of Love. Uh, we do have a copy of it in the library. If you want to take a, a further look at it, uh, it's in the Bethany College Library. And Lee identified... Uh, six types of love, and you'll see the list uh, next to it. This is worth spending a little time thinking about and talking about, because love is a word that, in my opinion, is much overused, and primarily refer, we use it to refer to a feeling state, uh, a positive feeling state that neurologically can be uh, can be traced and our brains are doing certain things. We're making certain chemicals that make us feel better. Dopamine, L-Dopa, something like that. Uh, that all make us feel better. But for me, real love is something that is communicated by action. Not just by the nonverbals uh, of, of uh, longing glances and, and intimate touch, but also by the action of physically putting oneself on the line, of doing for the other, uh, love seems to me to be more of a commitment than it is a state of feeling. But uh, Lee distinguishes six types of love. Eros, Ludus, or the Ludic love, Storge, Pragma, Manic, or Mania, and Agape. And I want to talk a little bit about each of these because from my perspective as a former clergyman, these make sense. Uh, and each of these has value for us as individuals. First of all, there is Eros. Eros is that kind of love that is that desires the other, that wants the other uh, for the sake of the other. The other is seen as beautiful, as wantable, as desirable. And Eros is something that that we then, uh, as as individuals, uh, participate in by becoming lustful and wanting. Uh, and wanting to be with and to be with in an intimate fashion. It is a good thing. It is a good thing to be intimate. It is not a good thing to be intimate uh, when there is no relationship. A hookup is just a hookup. It's not love and it isn't even eros. You may get a uh, sexual thrill, but it isn't truly eros love. It's simply lust. It works. I mean, uh, sex is a good thing. Sex is enjoyable and pleasurable. Sex is, uh, Billy Crystal says in one of his routines, sex is the best thing that you can do with your body, uh, except for maybe the water slide, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, and maybe it's better than the water slide. But at any rate, Eros is only one part of love, as Lee points out. Ludus, he points out, is a second kind of love. And this is the love of that is playful and gaming. This is the love that seeks and pursues. This is the love that gets the thrill of the chase going. It's also the love that, that enjoys the other. Once the other becomes not just the object out there, but then becomes uh, attached to me. This is love that um, for whom... For example, sex is no longer just about that lusty, mm, but also is about uh, is about the fun, the fun of being uh, with that other person. Uh, sex is about is about the fun of sex. Um, Ludus is a second 
uh, uh, a second type of love. Storge, a third type of love, uh, he describes as peaceful, or DeVito describes as peaceful and tranquil love. It's not passionate and intense. Uh, it, is not, it is not that lust, but it is rather that, that sense of, of simply uh, a calm pleasure in the presence of the other. Um, it is a love that, uh, uh, that will sustain uh, our couple through many, many years of marriage. Guys, I've been married now to this woman for 19 years. I was married to my first wife for 19 years. We're going to make it to 20 the second time around. But let me tell you, it has not been sweaty sheets and, and, and rumpled pillowcases for every minute of 20 years. Uh, there's been a lot of it that's just been, it's just nice to be with one another. It's just pleasurable. And we find pleasure in, in being together, reading books, sitting side by side, or watching TV, sitting side by side. You know, that is also a pleasure that you can get. And when one or the other of you needs that time, storge love, if you possess that, will allow the other, will welcome the other, will share with the other that time of peace, uh, that time of tranquility. Fourth, Lee talks about pragma. Pragma is very practical love. When you are in love, it isn't, I keep going back to this Eros image, it isn't all about uh, sexual fulfillment, sexual drive, gotta have it, lust, lust, lust. It is also, it is also a time in which you, uh, in which you have to, if you love someone, you have to be practical. How do we pay our bills? Love does not not pay bills. You cannot live on just love. You've got to be, I'm surrounded by stuff, you can see it all around me, I've got to be able to pay for my stuff. Pragma is that love that allows me to choose a mate, not simply on the basis of his or her physical desirability or attractiveness, but also on the basis of what will this relationship bring that will be fulfilling, that will, be, uh, uh, that will enable me to live the full life that I want. The pragmatic lover uh, does not rely so much upon just the feeling, but also upon logic. Sometimes you'll see that, that a couple, um, to give you an example, a couple, young couple uh, that um, uh, Christine and I knew well, uh, was Christine's goddaughter, um, they fell in love. Uh, she fell in love with a young man. And, and they were, oh, they just were so much in love. And they were together all the time. And, and, and life seemed to be such a grand and wonderful thing. But then she got to thinking about it and said, you know, I've never dated another boy. I think I need to move on and to find a new boyfriend. And so they ended what was going to be a young marriage and now she has reached 24 and is unmarried and, and very happy and we're happy for her. Um, but it was that pragmatic decision rather than either, either the lustful decision or the ludic decision that led her to decide to break it off. Sometimes love ends a relationship. Mania or manic relationships are, are the stuff of, uh, of film and theater. This is the love that simply cannot get the other out of their mind. This is the kind of love that you'll see in almost every romantic comedy. In every romantic comedy, one of the things that has to happen is you have to, when the, after the couple gets together, there has to be a point at which there is some difficulty that separates them. We watched part of 10 Things I Hate About You, so let's refer to that one. You remember that after the party, when, when Petruchio takes Kate home, uh, he resists her physical advances because she's drunk, and then she breaks it off with him, and he has to 
uh, decide what he's going to do. And he can't get her out of his mind. And she can't get him out of, uh, out of her mind. And finally we see that moment in, in English class when she's supposed to bring back a sonnet. And she brings very tearful doggerel, uh, very bad poetry, but this tearful doggerel that she brings back uh, re tells him how much she loves him and, and how they are meant to be, to be together. This kind of mania, it's an, an obsession with the other, uh, is also uh, part of being in love or a type of love. And then finally, there's agape. And for me as a, an ex-pastor, for me as a Christian, this is the, the, the deepest, most profound kind of love. It is the ability to love the unlovely. It is the ability to put the needs of the other before my own. Uh, St. Paul was, was uh, castigated uh, by modern uh, thinkers. Uh, for talking in, uh, ew, I used to know this one, uh, for talking in Ephesians, I think, uh, about uh, wives submit yourselves to your husband. I, I should look it up and, and get back to the, get ba I'll get back to you on the verse. Um, wives, be submissive to your husband. And then he goes on to say, husbands, submit yourselves unto your wives as unto the Lord. Or uh, that's what wives are supposed to do. The idea that I think Paul had was that each of us under agape, if we behave the way God behaved toward us in Jesus, what we should do in our relationships as husbands and wives, as lovers and friends, as those within the faith, is we should look to put the other's needs before our own. And if the society is, is arranged, if our marriage is arranged, if our life is arranged, where we are always seeking to put the other before ourselves and the other is seeking to put us before themselves, we will find our needs being met. Maybe not our wants. We won't always meet our wants, but we'll find our needs being met. For Christians, this notion of agape uh, was fundamental to the idea of what Jesus did on the cross. There we found him, says St. Paul again, emptying himself and taking upon himself our likeness uh, and, and being servant rather than, uh, rather than king. Or Henry Nouwen, a uh, Catholic theologian, uh, described it as a being a wounded healer. That is, in order to help others, I have to admit my own vulnerabilities. In order to help others, I cannot help them out of my superiority, but rather out of my own humility. This is agape. This is agape. To love the unlovely, to do for the unlovely, to see that the unlovely's needs are met. To love my wife, not simply because she is beautiful, which I think she is, not simply because she is clever or bright or, or, or witty or fun or any of those things, but to love my wife the way Jesus commanded me to love her is to love her in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer, until death doth part us. So it's that Christian ideal is encapsulated here in, in the use of the word agape. Agape, at the time of Paul, uh, the Greeks spoke about eros, they spoke about pragma, they spoke about uh, Philadelphia, phil um, phileo, uh, but the word agape, which which indeed existed in Koine or New Testament Greek, the word agape was not, uh, was not much used. It was the Christians who took this word agape and used it to describe what they had experienced in that risen Jesus. This idea of a love that is deep and profound and significant. This is the heart of Christian marriage. Now having said that, all of that is, is a way of putting a religious spin on it, a theoretical and rhetorical spin on it, a preacherly spin on the idea of love. And I do that unapologetically. It is part of our heritage as Christians at Bethany College that we indeed talk about things like love from the perspective of religious people. We also have to talk about love and forgiveness together. 
We can't just hold up these great ideals, including Eros, a great ideal, including Eros, and, and expect to meet it all the time. Um, if you've been with people for uh, any, any length of time, you know there are times when the most beautiful woman in the world, the handsomest man in the world, are just not very presentable. When they're sick, go watch Daily Grace from Thursday. She was not well. Not a pretty sight. When, when they're cranky, when they're irritable, when they haven't had their morning coffee, people can be very unpleasant. Well, that's love. At least that's what I think love has to do with it. Uh, love is at the heart of the relationship, but love is not all the same. And when we say we love someone, what we should mean ethically is that we want to do the loving thing, not simply say words about being lovely. Well, guys, I think that's it for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, that little piece in the middle. Um, we will be back. Let's see. You have some assignments. This is Friday, uh, the 17th of June. We're going to do Midsummer on Saturday, the 18th. I will have your papers graded. I will have your tests graded. Um, so you, tonight, uh, you want to go online, do a discussion on the main point of Chapter 7, uh, and a discussion on the evidence in the, uh, in the test, uh, or in the chapter. Uh, you have a writing assignment about ethical qualities, so I'll be looking for that paper. Um, and then on Monday, as we come back, uh, we will be looking at a number of things, and there is a bookmark for Medea's advice on relationships. I want you to look at that. It's kind of fun. Uh, but we're going to be talking about, and in the online discussion, is there a single thing that the, the media present as the image of human relationships? We'll be looking also at theories of interpersonal communication. And I have now lost the next page. Okay. And we're going to read... Uh, uh, rules theory, family rules in chapter 7. There will be a test on chapter 7 on, mon on uh, Monday, opens on Monday, and it will be due on Tuesday. So we will see you then. Uh, have a great weekend. Uh, get some work done. Uh, catch up if you need to. And we'll see you in just a couple of days. Bye-bye.